Well, we are going to take a really uh, fascinating and curious journey through a story that we don't often hear, the story of our soul. Not so much of our physical personality life, but of some aspect of ourselves that lives beyond death and surprisingly was alive before birth and is on a journey of its own. And we are projections, temporary projections of this. So I have this little illustration here of a light being holding crystals and into the star system and all, symbolizing our angelic self. And the lotus blossom, which uh, symbolizes awakening to your angelic self, your better self, your higher or enduring self. And so let's get started and fly through this uh, journey together. <clears throat> These are some Edgar Casey readings in which he explains this inner drive that we all have. Um, as the entity moves from sphere to sphere, it seeks its way to the home, to the face of the creator, the father, the first cause. Casey identifies the first cause as that the created would be the companion for the creator. This is the reason we were created, and as a result, the created, our soul, is given opportunities to, quote, show itself to be not only worthy of, but companionable to the creator. And since we're talking about the creator of the entire cosmos, you don't want to be a dull companion. So your soul is up and at them. Your soul is out really on a fantastic journey of exploration, excitement, and growth. Um, if you read Genesis carefully, uh, and if you could use a Hebrew lexicon or read it in Hebrew, you'd see that in chapter 1, Elohim creates us in its image. Now that is the infinite light being self that I showed you earlier. In chapter 2, Yahweh Elohim, which English Bibles translate Lord God, Yahweh Elohim takes the dust of the earth and shapes us, and now we become physically incarnate souls. Very interesting uh, dual life going on, the inner and the outer. The purpose of the heart is to know yourself, to be yourself, and yet one with God. The purpose is that you might know yourself to be yourself and yet one with the creative forces as opposed to the destructive forces. Those things that are uplifting, enlightening, uh, helpful, rather than those things that are downputting, critical, judgmental, heavy. And he says to us, speaking mostly to our soul, don't put the material first for you have to live with yourself a long, long while. Become acquainted with yourself. Know yourself and the relationship to the creative forces. Um, if your soul and my soul are immortal, that's a long time. And he's encouraging you to get in touch with that part of yourself. Of course you have a great personality, but your soul is going to be what's sitting there after the transition we call death. And it'd be nice to get in touch with that. Casey said that our taking on many forms in many different dimensions and spheres helps us to experience the whole of our being and of our creator's consciousness. Yet, despite our taking on many forms as we manifest ourselves, our true nature is, according to his readings, quote, a light, a ray that does not end, lives on and on until it becomes one in essence with the source of light. I was so thrilled when I found this slide. I thought, golly, somebody put that together for me. <laughs> and I, I captured that and uh, put it in here as a ray. Here's uh, one where he talks about the beginning long before you and I started and humanity started uh, living in the flesh and in the evolution of matter. We find in the beginning when the first of the elements were given and the forces set in motion that brought about the sphere as we find called earth plane and when the morning stars, that's right out of the book of Job in the Bible, sang together and the whispering winds brought the news of the coming of man's indwelling, of the spirit of the creator. 
became the living soul. This entity came into being with this multitude. Of course, you can imagine that individual's shock at this because they thought they were born in New Jersey a few years back. Um, we find the entity was among those in the day when the forces of the universe came together, when there was upon the waters the sound of the coming together of the sons of God, when the morning stars sang together over the face of the waters, there was the voice of the glory of the coming of the plain for man's indwelling. In all of these, we find some of this present entity's individuality, and in some, some personalities are brought through. Now, this is curious. See, he uses the term individuality for the soul self and personality for the temporarily projected self that is walking around in this gene pool and has been socialized by your upbringing and education. That's the personality. And then behind the eyes or within yourself, and especially in your dream state, is this individuality. And he's pointing out that these two have been traveling. I also want to point out that if you look back into ancient records, the sons of God are androgynous. They, can, they contain feminine energy as well as masculine. In fact, he was giving a reading to a female and he said, oh, here's one of the sons of God. <laughs> so, ladies, you're part of this whole journey too. You'll see in a minute about yin and yang. So here we go. He says that your soul is actually a star traveler, even though your physical self is an incarnate life liver in the terrestrial realms for what? 80 to 100 years, and then bang, you're, you're back out in the stars. So he talks a lot about our star journeys. As an entity passes on from this present time or this solar system, this sun, these forces, it passes through the various spheres on and on through the eons of time or space, leading first into the central force known as Arcturus near the Pleiades. Edgar Casey in the 20s and 30s was talking about Stargates before we even had the movie and the TV series. <laughs> he was, well, actually the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians were talking about Stargates, but he picks up on it before it's a popular notion in our lives today by watching Stargate series. So for him, the Stargate was the star Arcturus out near the Pleiades, which are the seven sisters, you know, the Pleiades stars. They play into Native American lore and a lot of other ancient cultures uh, considered the Seven Sisters to be a very special place for the souls. Uh, I think even Shirley MacLaine, she wrote about herself being involved there. Uh, eventually, an entity passes into the inner forces, inner sense, then they may again, after a period of nearly 10,000 years, enter into the earth to make manifest those forces gained in its celestial, terrestrial passages. It brings those celestial influences back into the incarnate life. Um, in entering, the entity takes on those forms that may be the dimensions of that plane which it occupies. Now this is, gets curious. See, he's not talking about a physical body here because he actually, in our physical body in the earth, we're in three dimensions. But he says you can actually be in the seven mental dimensions of Mercury, pretty far out. Um, four dimensions of Venus, five of Jupiter. There may be only one as in Mars. There may be many more as in those of Neptune. Or they may become as nil until purified in the Saturn's fires. He was giving one of his life readings, reading her book of life to this one lady, and he said, oh, here's a soul who goes off to Saturn often, and God loves one who's willing to start over. <laughs> Apparently, Saturn's fires cleanse you of any stuff you want to get rid of, and she liked to get rid of stuff. <laughs> Uh, here's the thing that's really curious. He says we don't just incarnate in the earth. We actually incarnate in higher dimensions of being, not in a body, in this solar system. He says it's like a university, and each of the planets in the system are like colleges within the university. And interestingly, the depth psychologist Carl Jung started to think the same way. 
because he noticed that these ancient people, loincloth corn growers, were studying the stars and the influence of them. And he was thinking, why are they doing that? They should be planting corn. And as he did, he thought, there's something in the human psyche that has some relationship with the heavens, or they wouldn't be spending so much time studying it and trying to learn it. And here's the way Casey broke it down for us. He said that our souls can experience these colleges and develop skills and all until we leave through the stargate Arcturus. For example, and it fits with normal astrology, by the way, classic astrology, in the realm of Mercury, you develop your mind, mental development, reasoning, order, and the like. Venus, the heart, the arts, music, love, creativity, healing. Earth, of course, is the causal dimension uh, where one finds an active opportunity, that should be an, to use free will to change. Um, more on the Earth in just a minute. Mars is madness, he said, power everyone's freedom to use the life force in a forceful ways to benefit or woe. It is your dealing with rage and energy and anger. Mars trains you to work with those sort of negatives. Jupiter is high mindedness, high ideals, large groups and the masses. Jupiter is kind of like the Venusian experience only with large groups, whereas this is one-on-one -on -one love and relationships. This is big group relationships. And I'll, I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Saturn, where insufficient flesh is redone, start over, the changer. Uranus are the extremes, the psychic ability, senses of the soul. Neptune, the mystic, contact with the creator. And Pluto is consciousness. Of course, as you know, our scientists demoted Pluto. So now they're thinking of promoting it back, <laughs> but the last I read, they had demoted it as not a planet in the solar system. So let me show you how this works. Edgar Cayce, before he reincarnated in the Earth as Edgar Cayce, he was told from the reading of his book of life that he sojourned in the dimensions of Uranus in which he developed his psychic ability, and as he was coming to the Earth to incarnate, he had a brief sojourn in Venus where he developed his love of individual people. And he wrote letters to people one-on-one. -on -one. He gave these readings to people one-on-one. -on -one. But his sister Lila, she didn't do that. Her soul sojourned in the dimensions of Jupiter. Watch this, large groups, masses, high ideals. Had a brief sojourn in Mercury, mental development, order, reason, she incarnates and she becomes one of the top executives of the International Red Cross. Large groups, mental capabilities. So see, Casey says actually uh, astrology influences your vocation and avocation more than it does um, shape your life. It just sort of gives you that influence. You still shape your life. This is a bizarre aspect of Casey that we don't normally think of because we think we're just earth people. But he says no. If you want to read more about it, there's this book in the bookstore called Planetary Influences and Sojourns. <clears throat> okay, but here's what we're really interested in because we came here. The college of the earth where cause and effect is a reality and it's the realm of testing. God even says to Satan, test him. Where does this come from? The book of Job. Uh, it opens up with the sons and daughters of God coming before God to present themselves and Satan comes among them. God turns to Satan and says, have you considered how good my servant Job is? And Satan says, eh, you touch one thing on his body or his property and, and wealth, he'll curse you to your face. And God says, test him. This is weird, isn't it? God just made a deal with the devil. <laughs> he just gave an assignment. In ancient Hebrew mysticism, Satan was the tester. Today we have him as the evildoer and tempter and distractor and all. But he was the tester. If you read the New Testament, you'll actually see when Jesus receives the Holy Spirit, the very next thing that happens is he goes out into the desert and is tested by Satan. Three tests. 
So you see, there is that woven in our literature that we're just not aware of, that this is a realm of testing. And of course, Jesus passes every of the three questions that Satan puts to him, and now he's really empowered. This incarnate life is a purposeful, intentional life by our soul for soul growth, and the troubles we have in this life Edgar Casey compared to the beauty of the pearl in the oyster. How does an oyster make a beautiful pearl? It gets an irritant inside its shell and it starts putting stuff around it and around it until it's gorgeous and not, not an irritant anymore. And we like to wear them around our necks and on our ears. This is something he wanted to point out is that much of the struggles in your life are opportunities for soul growth, not just bum deals that you got and someone else didn't. They're soul growth opportunities. And he explains that our soul actually f knew this ahead of time and looked for these opportunities. The, the thing is, we often uh, are born into these opportunities. They're our parents, or we marry them, or we give birth to them. Oh, such a cute little baby. <laughs> now a teenager and wants the keys to my car. <laughs> oh my gosh. These are the soul growth challenges that appear to be unfair outer life situations that just don't seem right. Uh, each of us has our own unique challenges and we should look at them more as opportunities. Now, if you're familiar with Carl Jung and Sigmund Freud and a lot of other deaf psychologists, you know that they like to look at the dark, bad stuff in our life because there they think they can find the potential for light and growth and breakthrough mentally and emotionally. So the same thing's going on with our psychologists. Okay, here is the concept of soul travel, which in the Eastern word is, uh, world is the cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth, or reincarnation. And it's hard for us because we focus so much on this incarnate life and it's so purposeful and so meaningful. We really want to focus here. This is the opportunity. But if you can get a bigger picture of your soul's journey, when you're incarnate in this life, you can see past influences in the present. And that is very helpful. So as you can see in this diagram, there's a realm beyond this realm of oneness and the spirit and there's a realm here where manyness and the physical. This is an Egyptian uh, diagram of reincarnation, showing you coming out of the infinite mind of Elohim, incarnate in the body, you sow with your free will, you sow your seed, and then you leave again once you make the transition back into spirit, you, come, you reincarnate, reap what you've sown, sow more, and you go over and over and over and over here until you get it right or just say, I'm out of here. You know, you know, Edgar Casey gave about 15 people the statement, this was their last incarnation. And uh, we knew some of these people and they weren't perfect. So you don't have to perfect yourself here. So apparently they were ready to split. That's it. <laughs> Do it somewhere else. But do you see what happens? You come in. Now I want you to notice a woman, the only way you can get into this dimension is through a woman. I, I guess you've figured that out by now. Okay. She is preparing a physical vehicle in her womb, and you're attracted to this opportunity either by karmic force, which you're going to learn about in a minute, or by uh, some soul group relationship with her. And so you come into that fresh body. It takes you a while to develop your physical legs. Then you're living your life and really involved and relating with other people. And then that darn thing stops working on you. Bam! You have to leave. Now you're up here. Edgar says the same thing happens here. You have to regain your soulful spiritual legs. And then you start sojourning out here. And soon you want to come back and work on more things with more souls and bang, you come back in. But I want you to notice, this body is not this body. And the people you meet here, their souls are souls you've known, but they may be in new bodies, new looks, and new arrangements. Often that was the case where 
uh, your mother in a previous life was now your sister. Um, and she was bossing you around <laughs> as though she was your mother, <laughs> you know? These influences carry over, but the situations can be different. And eventually you can leave. <clears throat> Another thing I want to point out is they're not even like my drawing. Uh, for example, little babies being killed in the bombing of London during World War II were reincarnating very fast. So I would have drawn a very short line here and then back in quickly. He said they were reincarnating in um, New England within four months after being, their bodies being destroyed in a bombing in London during the war. See how your soul can come quickly? Per, he and uh, Rudolf Steiner, any of you heard of Steiner? Yeah. Okay, he was European while Edgar was here in the U.S. They both say that the soul doesn't enter the body completely at birth. It comes in stages. Uh, and once it gets to 21 years of age, the soul is pretty much here. If the body is damaged after 21, then the soul may or may not come back quickly. But if it's before 21, the soul never really got a full chance, so it's going to reincarnate fairly quickly. And that's why he had... Um, souls coming in who died just months ago in a bombing coming back very quickly. So it's not as even as I show you in the diagram. Uh, they can be very long, very short. Uh, you can have a few or many. The fewest I ever found in the Casey readings was a guy who had only incarnated four times and the most I found was several hundred times. We travel in soul groups and relationships are very important. In fact, uh, Jesus, when he was asked at the temple, what are the two greatest commandments? He said the first one was love God with all your being, and the second was like the first, love one another, you know. That's not like the first. God and I, he understands me. I have this relationship. Have you met these people? <laughs> this is not like the first commandment. <laughs> God understands me and is patient with me, and... These people, <laughs> the only way you start to realize the truth of Jesus' statement is when you realize that the personal relationship you're having is with a God who loves them too, conceived them also. Oh my gosh. Uh, this young man was coming to Casey getting all these yoga readings from him and he was getting really fantastically healthy. His mind was expanding. And one day Casey interrupted him during one of his question periods and said, you think it's great to be one of the children of God. It's far greater to be one with them. You're building a heaven all by yourself and you're not going to want to be there when you get there. It's time to go out among this disgusting bunch of human beings you live with and relate to them because they're going to be there too. So this is the big thing, soul groups. Now this is a soul group. <laughs> these are the shy lights. When I was 16, and most of you don't know what that's like, these were a hot group and their best song was Oh Girl and have you seen her, and I used to really like, and I can't think of anybody who could wear these suits like these guys. <laughs> of course, I'm talking about this kind of soul group. We have been traveling. Most of the people in our lives are people that have been in our lives before. They're part of our soul group. Uh, we know them. It doesn't mean we're thrilled with them or they're thrilled with us, but we've had a lot of experiences together. And once you get it, that into your head, then it's more easy to relate with them knowing, well, we probably have some junk together or we probably have some real good stuff together. Why do you see a person for the first time and suddenly have this angst in you? You're like, oh, God. And you see someone else for the first time and you have this, whoa, <laughs> oh, yeah. And a lot of that is because your soul sees through the same eyes you see through. And it instantly knows, oh, this is one of my friends. This is a soul I know. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to be perfect in every phase of life. There will be some issues you might not agree on. But much of it you two have shared and you know. And the other one, well, you have not agreed much in life. And you're bringing that stuff back. 
Edgar and his wife, Gertrude, gave birth to two boys who were on opposite sides of battles often. Can you imagine raising those two in your house? They were probably breaking up fights all the time. But I knew them when they were adults and they were playing bridge together. They got along very well. They had healed all of that stuff. So keep in mind you are traveling in, with other souls that you've been with before. Now I do this little drawing to show you, let's say the red is you. You can actually be connected with other parts of soul groups that your whole soul group with you today have not had contact with. So I want you to be aware of that. Your soul might have had a period, a sojourn, or a brief interaction with other people that your basic family and friends don't have, even some very isolated ones. So it's not solid. You have to be a little flexible. There will be people in your lives that are um, relate well with you that your rest of your family doesn't have any contact with. Never, they weren't a part of their soul group. <clears throat> there is one soul group absolutely all of us are a part of, and that's all the souls who came to the earth. And according to Casey and many other sources, ancient Maya, Toltec, Aztec, Egyptian, not all the souls created by the Creator have come to earth or will ever come to earth. But certainly we did. <laughs> And we're called the morning stars in the book of Job. And this is sort of an icon of the life flower of the soul group of the morning stars who sang together at the coming into the earth. It's in the book of Job. I'll show it to you in just a second. So you are part of a large group. Now, as you know on the earth, and if you watch the news, we're not thrilled with each other. We're battling each other. Trying, some of people don't like certain people. Some people are killing other people. There's a lot of turmoil in this group. But this group has got to resolve all this stuff. So there's a lot going on. Remember, all of them incarnated intentionally, purposefully to learn, <laughs> to change, to grow. So a lot of the junk we see going on is soul growth challenges hatred that has to be resolved, things of this nature. Of course, there's a lot of love going on, too, a lot of good things going on. <clears throat> so here's the quote from Job, verse, uh, chapter 38. All these light beings, these celestial souls, came into the earth, and at the time, we thought it was cool. Looked like an interesting place. I don't know how you feel about it now. Your soul's probably ready to get over with it. Um, according to most of the legends and prophecies about the Aquarian age, we are going to have a transition here. It's coming to where there's going to be a shift, and everybody's going to become more aware of who we are and what it's all about. Edgar Cayce said the ancient Atlanteans carved 32 stone tablets with the whole story on it and buried them in three locations on the planet, just like the Dead Sea Scrolls. And when we find them, we'll be shocked at the story that we are actually celestial beings, eternal celestial beings on a journey, and we've been here for too long. <laughs> we need to get it over with and move on. So now, how do you incarnate? I found this wonderful wood sculpture in uh, Asia, and I wanted to show it to you because... As Jesus said in Luke, <clears throat> the kingdom of God is within you. And so here you see this artist carving your beautiful soul self with the smile on its face. Everything is floating upward, your light, celestial, uh, your mind is highly uh, attuned and connected. And you're coming into the encasement of a physical body through the soft spot in your baby head, the fontanelle, here you see this now. This is how you come into your physical body. You, you come in through that, the soul and the energy of your uh, spirit, and push yourself into the nervous system. This is the portal coming in. And then you're encased for a sojourn. I didn't like that word Edgar used, encased <laughs> for a sojourn. But if you read Ecclesiastes, you'll actually see the preacher writing the golden bowl 
must be opened and the silver cord must be loose so you can return to God the soul that God gave you. So I thought, whoa, this is, this is even hidden in the scriptures, the golden bowl and the silver cord. And so a lot of people using meditation, they loosen their connection and they feel this expansiveness. Sometimes you have it in dreams where you have a vision. Sometimes just in an intuitive moment or a prayerful moment, you have this overwhelming sensation of expansive celestial joy. And that's when you start to touch this part of yourself again and it's loose from the confinement of the physical body. If you go to the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, you actually see that our medical people are wearing a symbol from ancient times of how we came into the physical body called the caduceus. And actually, if you read the Yoga Sutras using some of our understanding of the body, you can see that his shashumna, the white ball and the golden shaft here, is actually your cerebral spinal system my spine and my brain, you see that? And that <clears throat> deep with uh, anterior, this is posterior, anterior is the woven pattern of the autonomic nervous system. So his Ida and Pingala are actually the two serpents of the autonomic nervous system. And the wings are the higher mind in which you've become aware of this and you lift all of this up. The circles on this one are the chakras or lotuses and they relate to the seven endocrine glands. This is a woman on the right side, a man on the left. And as you can see, the endocrine glands relate to the chakras in Eastern Yoga Sutra teaching. So if you know anything about endocrine glands, you know they secrete the hormones. You're talking about a powerful force inside you. Just imagine if you shifted your hormone chemistry. It would drastically change your body in very positive ways. So that's what he means when he talks about raising the energy, enlivening the chakras. Uh, Patanjali is talking about transforming the hormonal soup that you're floating around in here. And as you do it over a period of time, your body becomes renewed, rejuvenated, your mind is illuminated, um, and you're able to operate uh, with more energy, more of the life force that was given you by Yahweh Elohim in chapter two. Real fascinating stuff. Uh, there's a lot of books on this you can get in deeper, um, and s some of mine too. Believe it or not, we have yin and yang, and each of us does. And as you recall, the depth psychologists, again, are telling us that we need to get in touch with our feminine or our masculine because our whole mind has both. So back in the 70s when I was young and wild and crazy, and uh, they were telling me that I had to get in touch with my feminine if I wanted to have full consciousness. And most males who were doing this at the time, this was really a zany thought, but we were trying. And I watched my dad. He would come over to my house, and he would go straight to the dining room table, sit down. I'd say, hey, Dad, Dad, come on, we're, we're going to set the table and help set everything up. Hey, your mother will do that. I said, Dad, I'm not worried about my mother. This is my wife. <laughs> And then the baby would cry, and I said, let's go change the diaper of the baby. He said, no, I don't do that. Your mother will do that. Now, he was about 70 at that time. Now he's 96, and he's real cool when he comes over. He's learned a lot in 20 years. <laughs> comes over, say hi, immediately wants to set the table. He used to get up from the table after dinner and go sit in the other room, want me to go with him. I said, we can't do that, man. We're going to help clean up. That's getting in touch with the other aspect of yourself and your consciousness grows. Now, for the feminine, she is doing the same thing. She, according to this push in our society to get in touch with your other aspects behind your veil in your consciousness, she's getting in touch with her masculine, and a lot of forces are pushing her that way. So uh, according to ancient legend and all, this, this symbol called the yin and yang, this thing's 5,000 years old. That's how important it's been in humanity. 
and that each soul, uh, this is Shiva and Shakti in Hinduism, there are two parts and you have two parts of your soul. And really, this was the way it was until the second chapter, the 18th verse of Genesis. Believe it or not, in Genesis 1 and 2, the word Adam with a little a in Hebrew means a person or a being. It does have the connotation of ruddy, which means flesh, red, blood. See, so Adam was a ruddy person. In Numbers, the book of Numbers, they always translate it person, uh, being, or person. But in, in Genesis, those buggers translated man and used the masculine pronoun, which misguided all of us. You get to chapter, I mean, verse 18 of chapter 2. God cast a deep sleep over the little A, Adam, and pulls out the feminine. Now, these little buggers translated it rib. But do you know that same Hebrew word, when Moses is making the Ark of the Covenant, is used to describe the sides of the Ark of the Covenant? Same word. So really it meant a side of Adam, not a rib. Oh, I wouldn't want the karma of that translation. <laughs> God, I hope I didn't play a role in that. Do you see that? Selah is the Hebrew word for side and is used for the sides of the Ark of the Covenant. But in Genesis, they tweak it, rib. Ooh, that really screwed us up. And if after separating them, he had called them Eve and Bob, we would have gotten this. But they capitalized A. Anyway, you guys, this is the fact. You have yin and yang within you, and if you're projecting yang, you need to get in touch with your yin. If you're projecting yin, you need to get in touch with your yang. Now, everybody wants to know about soulmates because we're really into mating. <laughs> That's the fact. Edgar Casey had this lady come to him he was in his trance, ready to give her life reading, and she said, is my soulmate incarnate while I'm here? And he said, uh, yeah, about 30 of them. <laughs> 30? He said, yeah, you're focusing too much on mating. Soulmate is a soul that you've traveled with so much that the two of you know each other well, and you have a magnetism. You see? And he explained that a soulmate really is one who you can do a lot with. And it's not all sex. It could be like you write the lyrics and, and he or she writes the music. Do you see? The two of you have a link like that, you know? Yeah, you might also uh, become sexual partners maybe, but that's not what a soulmate really is in the ultimate. Soulmates are those who have had a lot of experience. So this woman was bright. She followed up with another question. So how will I know which one is the right one? <laughs> that was pretty good, wasn't it? <laughs> he responded, it depends on your ideals and his ideals. Whatever those ideals, do they fit? Do they work together? But after reading this, I thought about this. What were your ideals like at 18? What were your ideals like at 28, 38, 48, 58, 78? Do you see how we have to change? Do you see that if you're going to be a couple, if that couple wants to stay together, they have to grow in the shift of the ideals as the transitions of life grow. There are transitions in life, and they're going to happen, ready or not. And of course, we males all get blamed for midlife crisis. And of course, we all go through it. Uh, so obviously, there's got to be a shift, a change. So he's saying that type of soulmate depends on your ideals fitting. And if those ideals start to get out of sync, it can get to be difficult unless the two of you work to bring them back into sync. <laughs> So soulmates, he focuses more on soul relationship than on mating, which I know is a drag for us. <laughs> we, according to all ancient sources, you guys, even the Maya 
call us the children of God on a much bigger journey than one incarnation. Do you know on their stelas, the stone tablets in, in Central South America, they have carved their previous life. You know, at Palenque, Lord Pakal, the great Lord Pakal with the beautiful jade mask, he actually talks about his previous incarnation a million years before coming as Pakal. So it's known in ancient times that we were celestial beings temporarily sojourning uh, physically for a purpose. The Egyptians called the Aku is your light being self, and it is the blend of your soul and your spirit reunited, which they always knew when someone's physical body died that there'd be a period of time in which their soul and their spirit would be trying to find themselves again as they made the transition, and then they'd come together, and boom, the light being would be back. <clears throat> Here you actually see a papyrus relating this. This is a mummified dead body. Of course, the artist paints him smiling with his eyes open because there is no death of the soul. And they looked around and said, how can we demonstrate their soul to them? What, what can we use as a symbol? And they thought about it and they said, well, it is them, but it's the part of them that flies high above their body into other realms. Oh, great, we'll put a human head on a bird's body. And they called it the Ba, B-A. And there's the Ba of this individual who has died. And notice he's pulling out the feminine and the masculine, the Shem this is called, and that brings the white light back because he's reunited his soul in one. See, feminine, masculine. Also it means eternity and temporality brought back together and is lifting out. And you'll find these drawings all over ancient uh, cultures. What's uh, really interesting is Casey once gave a reading the first 10 minutes after death, in which he said, you're going to be a little startled because you're not going to be dead. And everybody's going to be crying over your dead body while you're standing somewhere else in the room. Interestingly, look at this. Over the, since about 1970s, we, the medical profession has become so sophisticated that you can die on them. Now I want you to picture this die, dead. Your body has no electricity, the blood's not flowing, you're an ugly sort of pale gray, there's no life, you're not breathing, you are dead. And yet because of medical science, they can bring you back to life. And you know what they do. Everyone in this room knows what I mean when I yell the word, clear! No, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're going to get that heart pumping again. They're going to shoot some chemicals in you. They're going to pound on the heart. The trouble was in the recovery room when the doctor would walk in and say, boy, we had a close one with you. And the patient says, yeah, I was amazed when you jumped up on my chest like that. The doctor said, wait a minute, you were dead. Well, I thought it was strange too, but I was over in the corner and you were doing this and that and I saw my body there. And now there are over 30 books on Amazon and here's Dr. Uh, Eben Alexander with his proof of heaven and some lady I don't know. Um, and here are some images. There's a lot of medical science evidence that a part of you survives the death of your physical body. And it's going to startle the poop out of you when it happens. Because you're going to find yourself still alive. And like Edgar says, you're going to be with yourself a long, long time. You ought to get in touch with that part of yourself. Imagine someone who's never conceived this inner aspect of themselves dying. And then imagine someone who has gotten in touch with their deeper self, their spiritual self, their soul self. Can you imagine the difference in their transitions? You know, that's what you ought to be aware of. Uh, this book first came out in the 70s. This was the first one with uh, Raymond Moody. And then these others just kept coming. Uh, and now it's a, a known thing. Now there are some doctors pointing out that they feel it's, uh, it's not actually an experience but a, a chemistry reaction in the brain. And uh, I just want to be there when their bodies die and say hi to them, you know. Uh, hey, I bet you didn't think you'd be here. <coughs> 
Soul growth is a lot about developing your better self. And Edgar says, never think too highly of yourself and never belittle yourself too much. You have almost lost yourself at times in feeling sorry for yourself. Man, I can relate to that. You have nothing to feel sorry for, exclamation point. God is just as mindful of you. That's really helpful to keep in mind. Though you have made a wreck of some people's lives, and I hate to tell you I can relate to that too. And you'll have to meet it. <laughs> There'll be a karma for that. But that you are alive, that you are conscious, that you have the opportunity in this period to apply yourself in the reconstruction of what man is looking forward to should encourage you to know that God is mindful of each soul. Then use the abilities that you have, and you have many. In Genesis 1, we were created in the image of Elohim. We have tons of talent, abilities. Just need to open up to them, apply ourselves to them, and be aware that God's mindful of us even when our life stinks or we've done something really nasty to someone else or to ourselves. Take hold of this. Wake up. Keep trying. Edgar said there's no surer way of getting there than to keep on keeping on. Amen. <laughs> uh, here's one of his most powerful gifts to us, and you have to really credit the disciple Paul, because he's the first one who wrote about the fruits of the Spirit. Do that which is good, for there has been given in the consciousness of all the fruits of the Spirit, fellowship, kindness, gentleness, patience, long-suffering, we don't like that one too much, love. These be the fruits of the Spirit. Against such there is no law of karma. Doubt, fear, avarice, greed, selfishness, self-will. These are the fruits of the evil forces. Against such there is the law of karma. Self-preservation then should be in the fruits of the Spirit as you seek through any channel to know more of the path from life to life, from good to good, from death to life, from evil to good. Seek and you shall find. Meditate on the fruits of the Spirit in the inner secrets of the consciousness. See how the kingdom of heaven's within you. Take some time to go into the inner secrets of consciousness. And the cells of the body become aware of the awakening of the life and their activity through the body. Your cells actually start to come alive again. The mind and the cells of the mind bec become aware of the life in the spirit. And the spirit of life makes not afraid. Then know the way for those that seek may find. So give you an example, one of the fruits of the Spirit is kindness, and here's Richard Carlson who wrote that great book, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, and It's All Small Stuff. Any of you read that book? It was way back, oh, it's a good book. Look what he says here. Choose being kind over being right, and you'll be right every time. Now, up until I was a mid-30s, I was one of these guys. Right was important to me. Everything had to be right and no fuzziness in it till I read this book and I thought, darn, I am kind of a hard guy. Uh, so next time I know that I'm right and they're wrong, I'm going to choose to be kind. Do you know my life changed? <laughs> it changed dramatically. Rather than always trying to make sure they understood what was right or that I was right, I started shifting to what he was saying, apply the fruit of the spirit of kindness. And man, I was happier, healthier, wasn't such a grouch or a wrestler or argument, argu argumenting guy, argumentative guy or whatever the word is. And people, I got along with people better, people got along with me. And amazingly, I found that often when I was really right, and sometimes I wasn't, but when I was really right, they would come back months or a year later and say, you know, you were right about that. But because I was kind, we still had a relationship. Do you see? That's a fantastic power in the fruits of the Spirit. It transforms you. And of course, love is the biggest one. And here with Paul, he really nails love. 
any time, you know, uh, back when I was in my uh, teens and 20s, I tried to practice these. We called them disciplines back then. And I went through a day in which I tried to just be loving all day long. At the end of the day, I found out that people were saying to one another, have you seen John today? He's a little weird today, man. <laughs> they weren't used to that. <laughs> Look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered. Remember how we can remember those things in a marriage? Do you know what you said to me three years ago? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I have it written down. <laughs> does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. Just imagine what it would be like if you started to try to live each day with a loving attitude, spirit, engaging others, even the obnoxious ones, in a loving response. You'd be transformed in a matter of months or locked up one or the other <laughs> it's not exactly a big thing in this world this is one of the most powerful of the fruits of the spirit even jesus uh, notes it as being the first and second commandment love god love others as you love yourself remember he put that in there see often we don't love ourselves as much as we should so I know you don't want to get into this, but we have to get into karma. <clears throat> Our soul is carrying influences that we have to meet from a previous activity here or out here, and those influences and those souls will manifest themselves in our life. Now, some of the karma is within ourselves as uh, patterns of habit thinking, uh, uh, urges, desires, weaknesses, vices that we've been carrying. Some of them are around us in relationships with others. Though there, Edgar says there's no karma between two people, uh, if you resolve the karma in your heart, then she or he will work out their problem with your karma with someone else. But as long as you keep engaging, then you do have this interconnected dynamic that causes stress. The kids in high school have this saying, which is exact description of karma, what goes around comes around. And that truly is the nature of karma. The power is in understanding how grace works. Here's a reading in Casey says, as one sets itself to accomplish that which is creative rather than destructive, influence no longer is the entity under the law of cause and effect or karma but rather in grace there's a powerful magic in the law of karma and jesus says not one jot or tittle will be erased from the raw, the law because the law is so perfect and the law is whatever you do with your free will you experience what goes around comes around Jesus also said, learn what the Spirit means when it says, I seek mercy, not sacrifice. So let me show you. The law is in effect. Whatever goes around comes around. What if you start to understand mistakes in others? The law is in effect. Understanding comes back upon you. And what if you forgive others for what they've done? The law is still in effect. What goes around comes around. Forgiveness comes back upon you. And what if you just forget they ever said it or did it? It's forgotten what you said or did. This is the secret magic and power of the law of karma. And if you apply it with the very next person you meet today, what you radiate out cycles back upon you. Understanding, patience, forgiveness, gentleness, it all comes back upon you. That's the magic of this perfect law, and that's why Jesus says not one jot or tittle will be erased. When I first read that, I was 
still naive enough to think, well, I don't stand a chance then because I've screwed up so badly. And uh, Edgar said, every thought, every action makes an impression on the collective consciousness. And uh, so I knew I was in deep trouble. Somebody should have told me that. <laughs> I wouldn't have been thinking these thoughts. He said that when he was trying to give a reading for a person, a psychic reading, he could hardly tell the difference between whether they thought it or did it because thoughts were as real as actions. I was a mess for two years in college <laughs> over that. I was thinking, oh my God. Then I came upon the reading that said, new thoughts overshadow old thoughts, and man, I was hot again thinking new thoughts. And every time a negative thought came into my head, I would push it aside. No, 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 we're not going to think that. I would try to transform it until I got over this, the power of this. And then you really start to grow, uh, and it helps a great deal. And when your relationships get a lot better because you're approaching them not so much from a selfish perspective. What can I get out of this relationship? What does it bring to me? But what dynamic in soul growth is occurring between us? And what could I add? What, what could I radiate out that would help? And you, so, so they don't appreciate it. So they spit on it or they're negative. It's like Jesus saying, don't cast your pearls before those who can't appreciate them. Then that's their business. As he said, if you change it in your heart, it doesn't matter what they do. They'll work it out elsewhere. You see what I mean? So don't get all up into that, but always be as open to them as you can because I've had them cycle back into my life and we've healed it, even though it looked impossible two years earlier. <clears throat> okay, here's some soul growth things. Uh, the dream state is when you are actually suspending your personality and you are in your subconscious soul mind. And if you would learn, here's a great book by Elsie, of dreams, I think it's in the bookstore here. Uh, you can really develop more of a connection with your subliminal consciousness behind the veil. And you are all there. I'm going to prove that you know your soul and you're very comfortable with your soul. I'm going to prove it to you right now. How many of us have at one time or another in our life been waking with something in the dream state? A vision, a nightmare, or a, an interesting dream and as we're waking, we notice the bladder's full. So we say, ah, I'll just go to the bathroom, empty the bladder, come back and work on this dream. So you go to the bathroom, empty the bladder, come back to the bed, and what? How's that possible? I just had the dream. You just experienced the two parts of yourself and the veil between them. So subtle a veil that when you engage the somatic nervous system to move the body, you went through the veil into the outer person who's in charge of the bladder, not the dreamer. It feels like you. When you're in the dream, this is me. I'm dreaming. It is you. It's your soul self. As you go through the veil, it's so subtle you don't notice it, but once you get on this side, it's so opaque, you can't see back through it. And you're sitting at the, on the side of the bed and the outer guy in charge of nothing but the bladder going, what dream was that? What was that dream about? And the outer guy will start thinking of the mortgage or what he's going to wear today. And you're lost now. You're never going to get back because you're in his world. Unless you lie back down on the bed, and I'm sure some of you have done this, and you start to drift a little bit, and bam, there's a part of the dream, and the associative process takes off, and you got the thing back because you went back through the veil. Do you see? How many of you have been doing something boring as heck, like driving the same route to work every day, and suddenly a brilliant idea comes to you? It happens. You pull into the parking lot. Okay. I had a brilliant idea, but I can't remember what it was. You just went through the veil. You bored the outer guy, so he let go. And here comes your intuitive soul self, comes right through and says, you know what would help this? That's great. And then as you're coming into the parking lot, you slip through the veil back into the outer guy driving the car, and he goes, what was that brilliant idea I had? The more you practice getting used to these two parts of yourself in that veil, the more transparent it becomes. And dreams help. So does meditation. Elijah says inner listening is the key. Hear the st uh, still small voice within. The psalm 
46 says, be still and know that I am God. In stillness you can get through into that. Um, Edgar Casey and others recommend working with others, participating with others in study groups, studying together, group activity, um, social work and caring for others, going to visit a sick person, um, activities that lift the lives of others that you help bring about. And of course, the biggest challenges in our lives, family and friends, that's where you really get into the crucible of karmic resolution and grace and come out better for it. And then Jesus says, no greater love has anyone than that they think of another over themselves. It, more thought about them than yourself. It doesn't mean you become a doormat. Believe me, he was tough love too. Notice what he said to Peter. One of his best buddy disciples, he says, Peter, we're going into Jerusalem. They're going to arrest me. And Peter says, don't go. <laughs> we fed 5,000, let's feed 50,000. We healed people, let's build hospitals. Jesus turns to him and says, get behind me, Satan. This is his buddy. You want to do what man thinks best. We're going to do what God wants done. So he's not a doormat, but yet he's thinking of others, loving others. You know the shortest sentence in the Bible is Jesus wept in the entire Bible. And it's when Martha and Mary were crying over the loss of their brother. He cried with them, you know. So you care, you have love for others, you feel for them, you help them. But it doesn't mean you waste your soul, your purpose for incarnating. You don't know. It's a balance between love and truth. And I used to do this with my kids when they were driving my car around. I'd say, okay, here's the fact. I love you, but don't you ever drive that car under the influence. Never, ever. And I gave them the credit card. And I said, you call me anytime, I'll come pick you up. Uh, you uh, get a cab, put it on the card. It'll be fine. And then I got my credit card bill, and I said, wait a minute. I think I need to talk with them about drinking too much. <laughs> Here's a prophecy I want to end with, so you guys understand there's a positive outlook from Edgar Casey. He was asked, uh, what will the Aquarian age be like? And he said to this lady, in the Piscean age, in the center of same, we had the entrance of Emmanuel, which is a Hebrew word that means God among men. See, what did that mean? The same will be meant by the full consciousness of the ability to communicate with or to be aware of the relationship to the creative forces. And he told his stenographer to capitalize these, these words because they were like God. They were a description of the God forces, the creative forces. And we'll be able to use them in material environs. We will, we will be aware of it. We'll be able to communicate with it. We'll be able to channel this sort of life force and solve our material needs more easily because we will fully have the creative power. He says this awareness during the era or age in the age of Atlantis and Lemuria or Mu brought what? Well, we know they destroyed themselves with their own crystal that was used to rejuvenate their bodies. Then they started using it as a weapon and started killing people with it. So they, they ended in destruction by misuse. Uh, and the beginning of man's need to come up through the journey of selfishness. We've been on this journey. It's about to end, and we're going to shift to an age of illuminated consciousness, uh, awareness that all people are one people. Whoops, I just hit the, the, my foot on the power cord here. Um, and that these things are going to change, and um, it'll be a great... Uh, era of illumination. Here's the drawback. Not every soul will be able to go through the Aquarian age. If you read Revelation carefully, it says Satan will be bound for a thousand years when Edgar was asked, and even ancient prophecies say souls will be separated, and those who have not gotten to a level of light heart, open mind, will not be here during the thousand year period because there'll be no negativity, no temptation. Can you imagine the earth 
with none of that and we're all here. It's a golden age for a thousand years. Then the revelation does say, after that wonderful phrase, it says, then Satan will be loose a little while and they'll be given another chance and we'll have to endure them <laughs> if we're here. God is always giving a second chance. Okay, that's the end. It's and right on the money. I hit the time. So bring up the house lights, uh, Kevin. <laughs> now, uh, I can quickly take one or two questions and then we got to uh, break. Yes, ma'am, way in the back over there. See her way back there in the white blouse? You mentioned um, after death, a time when the soul and the spirit are separated and come together. Uh, I've always used those words interchangeably. Obviously, you have them differently. Yeah. Can you explain, explain the difference between yeah, you are spirit so, uh, and yeah. soul? Yeah, you're so right. I always use them as the same, but Edgar defines them clearly. And the Egyptians do too. The spirit is the life force. It is your angelic, divine, uh, energetic. The soul is your unique story. The entity, what you've done, what your, think of it as your mind's memories and your mental dynamics. And you bring the life force and the mind together and you have the light being. Do you see how he's doing the difference? So uh, for example, a woman gave birth to a baby and asked uh, about this, and he said, well, the soul didn't enter the baby body for a day after the birth. And she quickly said, what kept the body alive? And he said, the spirit's the life force. The soul was wondering whether it really wanted to live with you. <laughs> I know one of my kids thought about that. <laughs> so do you see the difference? Energy, life essence, the entity, the mind, the story of the individual. Do you see? That's the difference he makes. One more question and then we'll stop. Yes, ma'am, right over here in the blue blouse. I have a, a master teacher teach us that um, a baby that was born without the mother and father is ready to be born. A baby that was ready to be born, uh, it wasn't necessarily what people think that the soul enters the baby when it's born. Right. And so it isn't, the, not that I am professing that I believe in birth, you know, either one of those, I'm very neutral because I don't know. You don't so know. I don't try to judge any of it. Uh -huh. But uh, I, that's the reason I don't judge it is because we were taught that, that they had made that arrangement before they came in, mm -hmm. the mother and <coughs> that child, to have that experience. Yeah. And so they're, you know, what we call is a horrible happening maybe may not be may not be yeah. right yeah so i don't know if edgar casey ever talked on any of that he did he said uh <laughs> like you said uh, in many cases the <laughs> souls have uh chatted about this in heaven before even coming right he said y your mother could be a little girl on the earth right now she already has all the ovaries she's ever going to have all the eggs she's ever going to have and a little girl, but you already know she's going to grow into a, a woman who's going to become your mother. You could, argue. but he said there is another another force at play. It could be a karmic destiny, as well as a choice. It yeah. might be a choice. It might be karma. But yes, there are forces at play. Right. But believe it or not, um, the souls that are going to be your children or have been your children have a sense that that's going to occur. They still have free will. In fact, Edgar uh, told two, who, two children, and the second born didn't like the first born being bossy, and he said, well, you were supposed to be the first born, but you pulled out at the last minute, and so he came in. Yeah. So you can't blame him. <laughs> Do you see? So there's still free will going on. This is a physical vehicle the mother has made. She, in her sleep and all, she has a connection with those souls, and they're going to come in, and there's an agreement going on in, the, in deeper minds. But it can still shift. Okay, we got to stop. Uh, okay. it's oh, I have more? Oh, 11.45. I thought it was 11.15. I'm sorry. Go ahead. What's the next question? Yeah. I stopped a, a little early. Go ahead. Uh, 
the Native Americans believe. Yeah. The, so the Right. So the question is uh, voluntary or involuntary uh, soul travel, um, out of body experience, uh, voluntary or involuntary. Yes, uh, Edgar has talked about that and um, he says sometimes the chemistry of the body is such that it forces the soul out, that it's just too toxic or something like that. An accident can force the soul out. The for he also talks about, and so do several other sources, um, certain terrible conditions in the body might force the soul out for a period of time. So you're sort of delirious, you know, um, and you only have the lower self going because the soul is uh, withdrawn. In some ways, it's believed that um, when a serious accident occurs to the body, the soul re 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 withdraws to a degree to keep the perfect image of the body um, dynamics, the morphogenetic field of the body perfect, so when it comes back in, the healing occurs faster. But if it stays in the body, and we do force it, usually we try to keep them awake, if you stay in the body, the more the mind looks at the damaged fingers or whatever it is, it starts, it makes it harder for it to heal. But if it withdraws what we call shock, withdraws, it's holding the perfect. And when it comes back in, then this reforms faster. They're still trying to understand how a little lizard can regrow its tail and we can't regrow a damaged digit, you know. And there's a lot of research in that uh, going on. We're still not sure, but there's theories coming up and one of them was what I said. Now, intentional out of the body and all, yes, that's also discussed. And like you said, Native Americans did it on purpose. They knew how to uh, f release their spirit, their soul, for a period of time. Ancient Egyptians did the same thing. Um, Mayans did the same thing. Mayans created altered states of consciousness. There's a lot of magnificent articles on this, too. Um, of how the ancient ones, and those were us, you guys, not somebody else, we were the ancient ones, uh, knew how to uh, take a break from the in encasement in the body and experience the celestial. Edgar Casey said the safest way is through dreams and sleep. During dreams and sleep, the body is subdued, the outer personality is subdued, and then you can actually meet passed on loved ones, chat with them, go into other dimensions, uh, do activities. There's a book he recommended, uh, The Laws of Psychic Phenomena by Hudson, and it's in the bookstore. Hudson was practicing this stuff, and he would go freak his neighbors out by uh, doing one of these out of the bodies and appearing to them in their bedrooms around midnight. And yeah, I mean, they would come the next day. Were you in my room last night? And he would giggle. <gasps> he traveled in his subtle body, but you could view it. But remember, the people that saw him were in sleep twilight. So I think their souls were more receptive to the mind's eye. Because I don't know if your carnal eyes can see a spirit. You know, they usually need light on the cones, you know. And Anyway, yes, there's a lot of that. Yes, uh huh. Here comes the mic. I know in general most literature uh, says it's not a very good for the soul uh, if one commits suicide. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's anything in the Casey readings that would indicate that the soul may be better off having committed suicide than enduring the suffering or whatever it is it's going through. <laughs> Mm -hmm. that is harmful to the soul while it's here in its present life. Yeah. Is, there, is there anything in the readings to indicate that maybe yeah, the soul would be better off? Uh -huh. In the Casey readings, uh, he addresses suicide and abortion. In other words, abrupt departure of the body. Do you see what I mean? He explains that a soul uh, is in a body and abruptly destroys the body, so the soul. There, it's much harder transition because usually we die over a period of time. 
you know, so we make a transition. We're adjusting to death. But let's say there's an accident and you are abruptly destroyed the body and you have to leave or you commit suicide. He explains that you don't realize, and in fact, Mr. Casey himself, when he was in a room like this talking, he could flip a switch in his head and see all the discarnates in this room <laughs> as well as us. And just to freak us out, he'd take a question from one of them. Yeah, you in the corner. And everybody goes, Edgar, there's no one in the corner. Oh, this is Bob from Alabama, and he's still hanging around. He has a question. <laughs> okay, so there are discarnates or souls and angels, according to Casey, angels and all. He saw angels, fairies, all those little people that we think of as uh, fairy tales. And uh, they are, there are some who are purposefully in an assignment to help the transition of uh, abrupt death, suicide, and uh, abortion. And he explains that uh, all of that is going on to readjust the soul for another opportunity. But it takes time, it takes transition. How many of you have known someone in your family who died years before their body died to their interest in this life? Yeah, yeah, some of you. Yeah, I, I have too. I watched him. He was gone four years before his body died. And uh, so trans think of it as transition. If it's abrupt, then you still need the transition. And so there are souls on the other side. Now, should you intentionally um, destroy or damage the body, Edgar was not a fan of that. Um, though he always tried to create a condition in the body that would improvement, improve it, uh, even when there was serious damage or mental illness or m malfunction of certain organs and all that, um, there were times when he would reply, there's nothing that can be done here. But he never said, go ahead and kill the body, destroy the body. Uh, so he was not one. Now, you got to understand, we're talking about a guy in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Today, I don't know what the perspective would be from him. But back then, that's what he, he, he did not encourage that, that I ever read it anywhere. But he said there are a lot of dynamics to help the soul make transition. There's a gentleman over here. Uh, a soul twin be a soul mate. Go ahead. Uh, put the mic in, just so we record it. The question is, can a soul twin be a soul mate? Okay, uh, <clears throat> in the dynamic, a twin soul is the feminine half. So look at me, I'm a male, so my masculine yang dynamic of my soul came in through my mom's little baby that she made, and I incarnated. Now I know this gets spooky weird, but the feminine aspect of my soul could come in through a female. <laughs> and that's called a twin soul. And Edgar identified them. He would say, this is your twin soul. In other words, it's half of your soul. Very occasionally, they could become mates, uh, sexual mates, partners sexually. But most of the time, most of the time in the readings, you'll find they work together. For example, <coughs> Gladys... Turner, Gladys Davis Turner, Edgar Casey's longtime stenographer, was the twin soul of Edgar Casey. He gave these channeled information, she recorded it all, indexed it up in the libraries, helped all of us, I worked with her, helped all of us uh, have access to them and all, see how they worked together? There was no sexual activity. They're, they're twin souls, though. Do you, so do you see the difference between soulmate and twin soul? Twin soul's a part of your own soul. And I met mine, I was 26 years of age, and I wasn't too thrilled with her. I thought she had an attitude. But <laughs> I did. I'm telling you the truth, you know. She probably thought I had an attitude. And, uh, but she was older than me, and she was a, a teacher uh, of this sort of stuff and became very popular and very effective. So I thought, well, she's doing what she's supposed to be doing. I was much younger. Uh, there was no 
mating attraction. I just sensed, uh, and I didn't sense it, I got guidance in a dream all about it. And Hugh Lynn and I, uh, Edgar's firstborn son, and I chatted about it a little bit. But, uh, so do you see the difference there? Twin soul, soul mate. Really, the mating stuff, we really into that stuff, and uh, that's tricky dynamics. We've matured a lot, though. If you look into our psychology today, most of us, and I mean even high school kids today will say, even though they're very liberal sexually, they, th won't they always say there needs to be a relationship, not just pure sex? Have you heard this? This, this is an advanced thought, because when I was 16, we didn't think that. <laughs> but when I was 16, going all the way was scandalous. <laughs> Today, <laughs> I mean, it was scandalous. It would, we would talk about it all around the school. <gasps> Do you know? <laughs> kind of silly, wasn't it, back in those days? But that's, I've been around. So where's the next question coming from? Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, as a mortician, I'm curious, how long do you think that the souls linger within the body? I mean, I know that um, your physical body does take time to actually die. You know, there's yes. the guillotine stories and the blinking of the eyes and all that. Um, is it still a matter of free will? I'm kind to them, of course, but I'm always curious yeah. to see how long you think. Yeah. Now, is this hospice-like uh, process? Um, well, I mean, I'm a funeral director, so I embalm. Ah, <laughs> you, they're already, yes, I got you. Cool. <laughs> Very different than hospice. Uh, yeah, you get them after the nurse. <laughs> well, um, during the transition, uh, souls come and go. And I have been um, at the death of a person over weeks, hospice, and watched uh, the illumination of the eyes and the color of the skin in the presence of the spirit and soul, and then it fades for hours or maybe even a day. So some visitors come by and, you know, she's just not here, and, and then the next day she's here. And, you know, so I watch that transition. But eventually, we know, and it is clear, the soul's departed and it is not coming back. So we definitely have the the remaining vessel dead on the table, the soul is gone and not coming back. Um, and now the near-death experience people tell us that the soul is still aware of what's going on, but it is not coming back into that vehicle. And uh, then there's a procedure for the medical profession in the coroners and the city. There are laws and all to identify definitely this body is dead and can be processed. And, and so when you get them, I can assure you there's no soul in the body. That doesn't mean that um, the soul isn't aware. Right. And Edgar encourages cremation over burial. He says it helps release the soul faster. The, the, the soul is uh, liberated faster because it has had an intimate connection with that body. And so the transition of the slow deterioration of the body, but he also points out there's no time for the soul. So, I mean, if the deterioration takes a year or so, it doesn't matter to the soul. There's no time. It is, there is one time for the soul, whereas for us, time is a very real factor. But if cremation occurs, the soul is liberated faster. Uh, and there has been a growth in, in cremation uh, these days, I guess, as you're well aware. Yeah. Okay, wait, yes, ma'am, uh, in the blue dress. Question. Yeah. Um, people who are mentally challenged, do they have a soul, or what kind of soul do they have? Explain missing a challenge. Mentally challenged. Mentally challenged, right. sorry. Mentally challenged. Um, I just read an article two days ago. See, see how the Spirit's helping me? Hey, John, you better pay attention to this because a lady's going to ask you this question. <laughs> when, you, when you stay in tune, you get help. <laughs> uh, I just read an article two days ago of more research showing cognitive reaction in coma patients 
to interaction with others even though the body gives no demonstration of it. The brain wave patterns are reacting to you coming in to visit or you talking or you touching. So I would say that there's still something worth uh, applying the fruits of the Spirit with that entity despite the physical condition of their vehicle. Okay, but I'm talking about mental retardation. Is that Ment any different? A child, a, a person that has mental retardation. Right. What, what kind of spirit do they have? Oh, they have the same as we do. Uh, it's just that the physical organism of the brain is not fully operating for the mind to be as we see the mind. But Edgar said in one reading, sometimes those who are perceived by us to be... Uh, mentally off are actually more in touch with the spirit uh, and that's why it's a little weird but you have to understand my brain could be taken out and pickled and put in a jar by medical science but not my mind but right now my mind is using this organism to operate the vocal cords to vibrate your eardrums and to reflect light so see this function if it's impeded, still doesn't mean my mind isn't uh, aware. It's just not functioning properly, do you see? The way we see it. So you, I would say still be uh, open and careful and apply yourself as best you can. Um, yes, uh, we gotta wait for the microphone. Oh, there it is, yes. Um, could you just uh, give a, uh, an idea to us of what Edgar Casey thought about uh, when we're born, why we choose a certain date, a time, month, you know, the signs, anything that he said about that? Yes. Uh, there's a lot involved in this. Um, he really sees a, a, a cosmic dynamic in the activities and movements and drawing and magnetism and urges and forces uh, affecting soul activity with one another and with yourself. So um, the, he did see that the, in, in roughly 60%, so 40% of the time he said uh, the astronomical influence, the time of birth is not correct because the soul moved at a different moment. But he psychically could see when they moved, but we couldn't because we just looked at the birth certificate and said that's when the soul entered. But he said that can vary quite a bit. Um, so there are a lot of influences, but he did see them as important to understanding the soul. And so the position of the astrology of a birth uh, was important in 60% of the cases because, as I showed you earlier, it could give you an insight into vocation and avocation into the planet of previous sojourn that would therefore influence their dynamic. Like, Edgar was a loving, odd little psychic guy, and Lila, his sister, was a dynamic executive of an international organization. See the difference in them? So those were influences in them. Um, so uh, do pay attention to it, do apply it, but he said nothing is more influential than the will of the soul, the free will of the soul. The, the soul can overcome any influence of the cosmos that it may be dealing with or of a relationship. Free will was supreme, but nevertheless he liked looking at uh, all the dynamics of the influence and your attraction to certain parents. Now, just to show you, I was 19 when I read that our, we chose our parents and I knew he was wrong. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. I, it, I, I was so upset about being born to my parents that I had nightmares. <laughs> and I will give you one right now to show you how bad it was. I dreamt and over and over, this was recurring dream. Now I'm probably eight, nine, ten years old. That I was out in space and I saw a blue and white planet, and suddenly a tractor beam grabbed me and started me pulling me toward that planet. And I started yelling no and trying to fight with all my power. I went right through the clouds into 
northern New Jersey into a ugly, cold, inner city gymnasium with bars on the windows. And I was screaming, I went right through the bars, and inside this vast, empty gymnasium was a single card table, and my mom and dad were sitting there with no eyes. And I was screaming. And then suddenly, something would grab my shoulder and shake me, and I would open my eyes, and my mother would be there, and she'd say, it's just a bad dream, honey, and I'd go, no! <laughs> <laughs> and she would go into my dad and say, I don't know about that son of yours. <laughs> but we healed all this. We, I, I was the oldest son, and my dad was a naval officer who would go away for many months at sea, and my mom and I had to handle the three little ones, and she needed a lot of help. My mother was very uh, emotional, volatile woman. She just passed on last month at uh, 96 years of age. Uh, two days ago would have been her 97th birthday. But I can remember uh, really healing things by us being forced together when dad would go to sea for six months. You know? And uh, we became really good. And later, dad and I would play golf. I'd play bridge with mom and dad and other people, and we healed all this. My dad's still alive. He's 96. I have lunch with him once or twice a week. We healed all of it, and I didn't want to come. I, di I didn't choose them. I don't want to be here. And look what happened. It's really worked out great. Okay, where's the next mic? Yes. Hi. Um, actually, feeding off of what she was saying in reference to the mentally challenged mentally. and all that, would it not be possible that when you were talking about the soul growth and the learning and all of that and the choosing prior to coming, that that isn't just part of their journey and what they're supposed to learn, how to get through, whether it's the parents, the families, the friends, whoever their soul group yes. is, that that was all supposed to happen? Yes, okay. it is possible. In fact, in one reading, now remember I said one reading, don't apply this to your situation unless you're certain. He told a family member who said, uh, why is Uncle Walt in our family? He just destroys all family meetings. He's a mess. He makes the family worse. And we all love one another so much. Why is he here? And Edgar calmly said, well, his soul thought it would help all of you develop patience if he wasn't a nice guy. Mm -hmm. So mentally ill could also be a way of helping the rest of us. I'm not saying in all cases, okay? I only had one reading in which he said that. Yes? Okay, mine's is kind of off topic from what they're talking off about. Off topic's fine. <laughs> when you went into the dreams and you're saying we step into a veil, will you come into your other body? I have a question. When you're dreaming and you feel like you're awake but yes. you can't move, Yes. is like what type of veil or interaction would that be considered as? Or? Okay, did you hear her? She's dreaming. She knows she's awake, but she can't move the body, okay? You are in your, you are truly in your subtle body. You are in your soul self. You're in your subconscious and maybe other levels of awareness, but you're not inside the nervous system of the physical body. So you can't move it. Uh, you, so even though you're trying to engage it, you're not in it yet. Have you, have you ever been a, a, a waking and really can't get the body to function out here? So it's taking time for you to rewire yourself into the... But they said from the background that I'm finding... Yeah. Said it's the devil writing you. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> he everything together because then it comes into yeah, yeah. Now you know where this comes from? The devil wrestling for the body of Moses. Yes, yes, you are right. The, the thing is, the evil forces um, even meet with Jesus Christ when the Holy Spirit comes upon him. The challenge is always there. The dark forces are more, the evil dark, are more the forces of testing. And if you could accept that, it wouldn't be so much uh, as um, this sort of uh, killer, uh, distorter, uh, all this sort of energy. 
But yes, the angels wrestled with the devil to protect the body of Moses from him possessing it. And that's where the thought is, when you're in twilight, you're, in, you're vulnerable. Now, Edgar did say, always go to sleep surrounding yourself with the light and positive thoughts. Um, don't go to sleep angry, he said. Don't go to sleep uh, uh, with bad negative energies and all. Try to pause for a while and get your energies right and surround yourself. So I understand what you're saying. Yes, that, that would be important to call on the higher forces. I always believe in evoking the presence of heavenly forces. They're all there. Why not evoke them? You know, as bad as I am, they don't care. They're willing to help. If you ask, they come. <laughs> so I hear where, where you're coming from. Yes, where's the other? I just wanted to ask about deja vu. Deja vu. Yeah. Your soul is seeing through the same eyes you are, and I have to end in just a minute. Your soul is seeing through the same eyes you are. So it sees people from a soul memory. It sees scenes from a soul memory. I've been here before. Um, and sometimes uh, it has a sense of I've done this before. I know this. And for example, let's consider Mozart. At six, he was more skilled in music than 60-year-old men who had plied themselves all their lives. How can that be? His soul was more present, and their souls were not quite as present. They were learning music more with their outside self. He came in, and he could write a symphony, and he couldn't even quite play it with his little boy fingers and his father had to help him. That's how fully he was there. So your soul is right there with you seeing things. If you start to not poo-poo that stuff in your children and in yourself, you'd be amazed. It'll explode. You'll start to see more and more, feel more and more, and, and more talent will flow to you, more awareness. Okay, now it's time. 